you want to step into the future, this is the time for you to review all this teaching. So that's why today, we are still celebrating the conclusion of Passover. But remember just now, that someone was prophesying that, you know, the, the power of resurrection doesn't end with the celebration. It continues on and on and on. So it's time for us to, to look into the future. Now we have done quite a few series in the past six months, building the house of the Lord for the future, I think six or seven or eight. You can review those things. You, you know, we talk about watchmen and intercessions. Now I'm just promoting all these things because it will help us in the next six months. It will help us in our warfare. So we, we go all the way back to, to the Sarawak elections. And uh, of course, regardless of the result, it is important that we deal with past trauma. It is important we deal with the current emotion. It is important we don't let hope defer, come into the land, don't come into the heart. So I'm, I'm glad to see many of you here just celebrating once again. So I want to conclude the whole Passover weekend by, by going into today's, it's a time to look into the future. So this next six months, God is going to cause something to be developed. So let's just talk about the time that we are in. Actually, you know, when we think about the, the exciting time, it is a time of restoration. Everyone says restoration. So it's like there is a Spirit of God moving and He is changing things on earth. What is the purpose? So that all things can be restored. Restoration is linked with harvest. There is an end time harvest that we've been talking about on and on. But the time is really in now, this decade of great harvest. But before we can go into the field and take all the harvest, things must be restored first. Acts chapter 3, verses 20 to 21, and this is Peter preaching, and that he may send Jesus the Christ, why is it important? The Messiah. Jesus, now his position is the Messiah. He is no longer just the Passover lamb, but he has become the Lion of Judah, right? That he may send Christ, uh, the, Jesus the Christ Messiah appointed for you whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things. Everyone say all things. So there are many things to be restored. Some have been restored but not quite. And, and about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. So it's like all the things that has been said. Now, one of the things I really want to encourage all of us, every time we are confronting with difficult revelation, every time we see something, we hear something that we find it hard to process, always look at the full counsel of the Bible, full counsel of the Word of God. So that's why I say all the things the holy prophets from ancient time prophesy. Now, the word receive here is a Greek word, the komai, which means to take up, to hold up, some translation use, Jesus must be retained. It's like, what kind of expression? He ha he's, like, he's locked out in heaven like that. It's like receiving a guest. So when we look at all these things, it simply means that Jesus must remain in heaven until all things are restored. So if we want to quicken his coming back again, if we want him, you know, this is always, you know, when we were students and people will be like, cannot see for exam didn't prepare now and they will say, oh, come back, come back, come back quickly. But it's like there is condition, there are conditions for Jesus returning. And one of the conditions is restorations of all things. Very important. So what restorations are we talking about? So one of the most obvious one, of course, restoration of truth. We talk about that church history, 500 years of church history. Now, I know in recent time, we haven't really talked about church history. Whereas the past 10, 12 years, we are like talking about it for so often. But it's good to review. I, I think those of you who are our tribe members, you should be able to, to know this and even be able to teach people, show people what the 500 years of restoration of truth. Then remember we did the course on the restoration of the tabernacle of David and, and that is what was prophesied in Amos 9 that God will restore the tents of David once again. So this is the third day church that we're talking about. Then another thing, and this is linked with Passover, is the restoration of God's design in one new man. Everyone says one new man. So you have the Jew, the Hebrew, the, the original covenant people. Then you have Gentile. So are you a Jew or Gentile? Any Jews here? 
Maybe there's some hidden Jews in your bloodline, okay? But most of us are Gentile, right? So it's like the Gentile and the Jews come together. And it's like we are not becoming Jewish, but we are becoming one new man. There's a great difference. Then what else? Restoration of revelation for end time conflict. So one of the teaching we did is really process like Daniel. Uh, we're in that season, the third year of the pay decade. So Daniel chapter 8 to 12 is all about the are revelations. Very interestingly, remember chapter 12, after, they, after Daniel received the great revelation, what did God tell him? Hide away the revelation. Don't let anyone see. One day, they will want to scramble for that. I, I feel like we're in that one day where we have to scramble for the revelation that will determine the fate of our land. So I'm glad today, so many prophetic words concerning the land, so many prophetic words concerning the wind from the east because that is a covenant, that is a root covenant that God has given to, to East Malaysia, to Sarawak, to Cebu especially. And I was just reminded of, of the 10, 15 years period, so many apostolic prophetic seed came into that land. And even though many have fallen away, I believe that God is going to restore that covenant root, which is going to be crucial in days to come. So, let's talk about the Feast of the Lord, right? We are celebrating today. You can see the decoration. And, you know, we celebrate Passover, but we are not very legalistic about that. Because, one of the things I would say up front about the Feast, and I know some of you will be like, last week, Easter, right? Why are you talking about Passover? Why are you talking about some Old Testament stuff? You see, the Feast are instituted by God. God asks us to celebrate. Every time we celebrate, it points us to Jesus. So it's very important we, we have that right mindset. So part of God's design, remember we talked about one new man, restoration of one new man, includes the restoration of feasts. And I remember 10, 12 years ago, now I will tell you, I'll be very, very honest with you, that when I first came upon all these feasts, I was very resistant because the Greek-minded people cannot understand this kind of thing very quickly. So I was like, okay, but by, by trust, Apostle Chuck Pierce, you know, just to go alone. It. But then I realized that one new man means, yes, we may look a bit more Jewish, but it doesn't mean that we are becoming Jews. It's different kind of thing. So Ephesians 2.15, this is what Apostle Paul said, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments. Now here's one example. People look at this verse and they will say the law is bad. But in Galatians, it says the law is not bad. The law points to God. It points to your deficiency. So that's why we can't just take one verse and come to a conclusion. We need the entire counsel. So by abolishing his flesh, the enmity, which is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so that in himself, he might make the two, Jews and Gentile, into one new man. So people will be like, okay, what does that mean? So let's look at other verses because we need all the different revelation to give us the whole package. Romans eleven seventeen, But if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive, so who is a wild olive here? It refers to the Gentiles. Because he was talking to the Gentiles. He was talking to the church in Rome. You are the wild olive. You were grafted. You know, any of you are interested in... Uh, agriculture or things like that. I mean, now that, that's, a, that's a rage, right? So, so, so Andrea was just sending some photos of Tintin helping her dad, helping Andrea's dad to plant certain things. And, and they live very near my house, okay? So maybe I will be, some, I will be the beneficiary. Also. So it's like, you, you know the grafting? You, you, you combine the genetic code of different plants. So nowadays you get very, very superior fruit, um, no rotting, you know, those kind of things. So it's like combining... So, the Gentiles are the wild olive. You were grafted in amongst them of the rich root of the olive tree, talking about the Jews, talking about Israel. Then the next verse, verse 18. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. You see, this just reminds me of the historical persecutions of the Jews, even by believers. You see, when, when, when Luther and Calvin was in the heat, it was in the the advancement of the whole Reformation, they persecuted the Jews. That's why Apostle Chuck Pierce say that the root of all racism is from anti-Semitic thinking. So that's why Apostle Paul reminded 
us 2,000 years before, do not be arrogant because he knew that. You know, remember God, when God created the Jews, he said, I will cause you to be the most humble people on earth. You will have nothing. But because of that, my glory can be manifest. Remember that it is not you, Gentile, who supports the root, but the root, Israel, supports you. So that's why we need to have the right mindset. I mean, if people say all oh, the things in Old Testament are irrelevant, just ask them, explain Romans 11. You can't. So we need the entire counsel and then God will give us the revelation. Now Romans 1.20 is one of my favourite verse of all time because you know Romans 1 is a very interesting passage. In fact, in many Western parts, in Canada for example, Authority have banned the preaching of Romans 1. They say if you preach Romans 1, you are preaching hate crime because it went down to least the perversion, right, of all the things. So that's why it's very interesting. It's very exciting the time we are living in because there are like-minded people even in different aspects of the seven mountains. They are pushing back. There are people in entertainment mountain. There are people in media. There are people in government. So you remember the, the big news, right, with, with Disney challenging the grooming law. Look at what Florida government has done. They have, you know, I mean, if you study the whole history, uh, basically Disney was secretly buying land in Florida. Because can you imagine if today someone came to your next door and want to buy the land and they say it's Petronas or it's someone, they, may, they might be oil in your land. All of a sudden, your whole neighborhood price will go up crazy. So in Florida, they went to use shell company and they bought a lot of the land. It's like as big as a town because they didn't even know that it was from Disney. This was, this was done by Walt Disney himself in the 60s. So eventually, somehow, they managed to get a deal that Disney is their own government in that place. Can you imagine? You are a company, you are your own government. Like, let's say we are our own government here. We say, come here, I'm going to collect tax, I'm going to collect toll, you have to pay me because it's a law. But anyway, to cut the long story short, the Florida government has removed that privilege. True law. Now, one of the things when that happened, and the Lord just spoke to me and said, Florida used to be a swing state. You know what is swing state? They can go red, they can go blue. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking about Sarawak. Sarawak used to be called the deposit of Barista National. But the Lord said, no more. For you are not going to be a swing state anymore. You are going to be a state that will cause an impact to this nation. So that's one of the things that when I read that, you know, when you read news, when you watch movie, God can speak to you in different ways. And, and all of us receive things. For me, I read the news, I see movie, and, and that's the way I process the things. So I just want to encourage you, don't limit how God speaks to us. Coming back to Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what? has been made so that they are without excuse. So talking about how, you know, people always say, these people never hear the gospel. God is not fair. But this is the verse, right? It says that through all the qualities of creation. But the word made here it is, a, sorry, it's not Hebrew word. It's a Greek word, poima, which means, which has been made a workmanship. That means the hand of God is involved. So it's more than creation. It includes everything that has been established by the law. So where am I going here? It includes the dealing, how God covenant with people. So we have to look at covenant model. We have to look at how Abraham had that encounter, how Noah had that encounter, how David had that covenant with God. It also includes God's wisdom on times and seasons, which is why we are celebrating Passover. It includes God's word on His appointed times. So every time we have feast, it's an appointment. Apostle Michel always say that, right? If you have an important appointment, would you miss the appointment? You wouldn't, right? I mean, it's like if you have a ticket to US, you, you, you say, I mean, even holiday is an appointment. If you spend a few thousand, ring it for a holiday, you wouldn't miss the flight unless something drastic happened, right? So that's the thing, that the whole concept about appointment time is God has that time frame that if we will come, there will be tremendous blessings. So that's a whole issue for Passover here, okay? So Passover 5, 7, 8, 2, we just 
So, so you know when Passover started, it's seven days celebration. Seven days just ended on Thursday. But remember, we are not being legalistic here. We're still in a spirit of Passover. So Exodus 23, 14, and this is what God said, three times a year, you shall celebrate a feast to me. And later on, he said, it shall be forever, right? So the feast here refers to the major feast. We just celebrated Passover. I, I know it was a bit late, our timing. By the way, we already have a date for Pentecost. Um, you know, I think later on we'll put in a group again, just to remind you. I mean, if you're able to come, I know tickets are not cheap and things like that. But if you really feel like you needed to be there, then you just need to be there. So, so many of us are, are so blessed, right? And Apostle Michelle and I were just talking. He's like, he's like, well, like, it's not even the teaching, you know. Like, people can't remember what we taught, but, but I hope you do. <laughs> and, and review. Because I felt like they, those are good teaching. <laughs> But it's the, the, the corporate anointing that causes us to, to press on. So I'm really glad today, even with Judah and all, we are still carry through the anointing that we receive and experience. So these are the feasts. So do plan for Pentecost. Do plan for Tabernacles. Of course, we do. I, I don't believe we, we are going to. You know, just how so many have prophesied that the pandemic is over. So, you know, how, how, how do you make it over? Live as if it is over. So, so we, we, you know, there was some warfare concerning some people coming back and people getting a bit sick and things like that. But I'm glad most of you are here. So, so do what you need to do. Get that revelation from God. Each feast carries a unique blessing. So Passover is so much warfare, so much pressing through, so much overcoming. So that's why when people can celebrate Passover, the next two feasts are easy. Normally, if they can't pass over, they can't process through the issues of their emotions, then they, they will struggle. So, to me, you know, I, I really, I feel like the, our God is a God of second chance, a God of opportunity, a God that allows us to try once again. So that's why Israel, even though they fell and they were in wilderness for 40 years, God gave them another chance. And even some from that first generation, Joshua and Caleb were able to be the leaders. Unfortunately, unfortunately, many in the body of Christ fail to recognize, remember we talk about restoration of all things, including this. So many fail to recognize the restoration of such feasts. Actually, we are at this stage, we celebrated for so long, it's not even weird anymore, you know. But I, I just try to remember the first time we do all this thing and, and, and people think we are a bit weird. And maybe people still think we are a bit weird. That's because they have not recognized that there's a restoration. Gloria of Zion did their first public Passover, I think, I can't remember, 2008 or 2009. And they did it in Texas University. And I tell you, after that, Chuck said he received complaints so high. Not from unbelievers, from Christians. He said, how could you do that? How could you celebrate an Old Testament thing? And then he was like, oh my, oh my. And so that's the thing, that when people don't recognize what the Spirit of God is doing, it will create this kind of thing. And they will deny the instructions and wisdom of God. That's why we have to recognize at every feast, there is a higher way. There is a superior anointing. And I already mentioned this, but it's worth repeating. The feast of God always point us to Jesus. That's very important because we are not introducing something weird. All the things in Old Testament it is a precursor, it's a shadow of the actual things. But when the actual things come, Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law. So that's why this kind of mindset, and many came from tradition, many came from theology and say the Old Testament is no more. Can you see how dangerous it is that whenever you don't like certain things, you just say, I'm going to remove that. Then in the end, your Bible will be just three pages of your favorite verses. And that's how we get out of balance. That's how we get hyper grace. That's how we get all the crazy things because people choose what they want to read and believe. So for that reason, every time we come here, there is freedom. Really, there is freedom. You know, even when Judah is like, come on, let's dance and things like that, you have freedom to remain a statue. You really do. You can sit down. As long as you don't disturb people, it's fine. And we don't, there's no condemnation. 
And, and that's why I always say, look, everyone must make a determination. There is no legalistic ways. This is the way Chuck Pierce put it. There is no legalistic way. You can't celebrate this in a legalistic way. Even when we do the cedar meal, right? And you know, we, we did it so many times. It's like I can't even, I mean, even the food tastes the same most of the time. <laughs> no, no, actually when we do it in, in KL, it's a bit different. Different cook, right? <laughs> but mostly the same. Oh, but this time the wasabi was really a killer. Uh, and, but it's like, even though it's the same, but the revelation is not the same. And many were able to understand finally that Passover is meant to be a freedom for us. So we need to think in terms of freedom and liberty. Every time we celebrate, there is great liberty. You can dance around, sing around, turn around, do whatever you want. Okay, with that, let's talk about Passover 5782, which is this month, right? April 2022. So mentioned already, already concluded last Thursday, but we're still celebrating because we want to honour God. We want to have that unique encounter. I already mentioned that it's very important. There is a spirit of overt hatred against Jehovah, against the great I Am. So that's why we have to move in the opposite. We are celebrating again here in KL and all the other places. Hopefully all the other cities, you have some kind of celebration or you just log in here because it's important that we go against this uh, God-hating spirit that is operating in this land. So remember, this is a decade of pay. Every Passover, we're still in that season, gives us a key, a special revelation that will advance. So we have to seize the moment. So I want to quickly talk about, I know today's teaching is more about looking into the future, but I just want to mention quickly some of the things I believe God wants us to do. Very general, very broad, but at the same time, it is something we have to ask God. Are, are these issues affecting me? Are these issues causing me not to be able to advance? So the first thing is we have to deal with the reproach. You know what is reproach? Reproach is shame. Reproach is something that happened in the past that you can't let go. Past seasons. So in the book of Deuteronomy, basically Moses was dealing with the reproach of the 40 years in wilderness. And he reminded them, this was what you did. Did you admit you are wrong? You know, basically he was like cross-examining them. You did this, right? You did that, right? So it's not condemnation. Sometimes people think deliverance is condemnation. No, it's not. It's forcing you to come to the terms of the reality. Because some people are not living in reality. Some people are in la-la land. That's why deliverance is, actually deliverance is very simple. It's simply to bring you from la-la land to reality. And then you decide. Continue here or you want to float again. Very simple. That's deliverance. I mean, so many of you have experienced that. So many of you are moving in that direction. So we have to deal with our emotional past. That's one of the things about Passover. But that's not the only thing. We have to deal with the present, present time. Unsanctified emotion. Any emotion that is not put under the cross is unsanctified. It is an emotional present that will cause us to go haywire. And, and this is the thing we have to ask God. Maybe we have dealt with the past, but what about the current things? What is our current hope? What are our anxieties, our worries? Are we putting them under the feet of the cross? Are we allowing the blood of Jesus to deal with that? So that's very important for us to ask, to, to deal with. Then we have to deal with hope defer. So, you know, yesterday... Uh, so Lara and I were just doing a, a podcast recording and you know, every time, every now and then, this hope defer came out. Because hope defer is so strong in Malaysia. It's so strong in this uh, land. So the way I define hope defer is an emotional fear of future. You fear for the future. You fear you can't cross over. In fact, when I look at Israel, the first generation, this was what happened to them. They couldn't, they wanted quick result. And even though it's only a few weeks and then finally God caused them to go into, send the spies, they came back and, and still, it, it was just full of bad faith. That's why they had a fear of future and it took 40 years of deliverance. So we had to deal with that. But the last one, and which is what I want to talk about today, is there has to be a hope and trust of a glorious future. Look into the future. So I'm glad today's prophetic words is all about look into the future. 
the pandemic is over, new opportunity, and all these things are, are very, very much what this Passover is all about. We have to leave the old. We have to step into that new domain. So four things I want to talk about. And in fact, this is going to be, you know, the things I'm going to develop for the next six months. And, you know, we have been talking about building the house of God, but I want to do a series, building the house of God in the seven mountain, because we are all called to different area. And seven mountain is different from religion mountain. It's different from the house. So we have to know what is our calling. What are the natural gifts? What are the spiritual gifts? What are the warfare? What are the intercession? Who are the Cyrus? Etc. Etc. Then we want to deal with covenant root systems. And that's why I just now, I was just really, really reminded of what happens when, 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 when Chuck and Tim came and even Cindy Jacob prophesied the, the, the intercessory wing from the east. I know it's happening, but it's not quite complete yet. And intercessors will know immediately that we have not completed the job, that the shift is not complete. So we are dealing with covenant root systems. By the way, every time we talk about root system, it's a good, it's a bad. So now recently, you know, we moved into a new house. So Solanshi is like doing all kind of gardening stuff. It's like becoming a wild place. Um, but when you look at the root system, some are good and some are bad. And you have to deal. Good ones, you preserve. Good ones, you add to it. Bad ones, you have to kill. That's why it's like if you want to save yourself from trouble, just you know, do like what Jared did. Artificial grass or just concrete the whole land. But some of us are called to be the, the tenderer of garden. So, so the, the Asher anointing, I mean, we just commissioned so many people into Asher, right? So, so people are already thinking, oh, what can I be commissioned into the next round? So it's a good thinking. I want all of us who are aligned with this house to think, what can you be commissioned into? Not so that you have more title, you have more certificates. It's like, I, I think we all have enough certificates. But it's like, what kind of, you know, do we want to be sent into the place? It's just that, it's a sending sort of thing. And this third point is something that really the Lord has been speaking to me. Possessing cities we do not build. It's like, wow. It's like great favor. I mean, there is favor and there is this kind of favor. Receiving city. Do you know how much cities are worth? And finally, the point I want to talk about is there is a generational impartation. We look at the end of Joshua's life. And you know, he had victories. He had done everything. But he was more concerned what would the next generation do? And that's something we always must have in our, at the back of our, our mind. So I'm just going to go through these things. We will unpack them uh, slowly over the next four to five months. Uh, but just an introduction today, okay? So Seven Mountain, I know a lot of us, we know Seven Mountain already. Now before Passover, remember the, the six months from head of the year, October 2021 to April, we've been focusing on building the house of the Lord, right? I mean, six, seven, eight series, I can't remember. And we, we talk about a few things, which at the end of every teaching, we, we kind of sum up, remember? So we talk about foundation. Everyone says foundation. foundation. Now this is so important when you build a house. You have to ask yourself, what, is, what are the core and non-negotiable? You know, for example, very simple. If you want a house, Landed, strata title, you know, budget, you know, budget is non-negotiable, by the way. And, and, you know, that's why even renovation, you know, you should set a, a, a hard, slightly flexible budget. You, you, can't, you can't be too flexible, otherwise, by the, by the time you, you become poor, you, you step into poverty. So these are the core, yeah, I, I'm serious, okay? So core and non-negotiable, those are the foundation. Then we talk about material. And from a personal spiritual point of view, we're talking about what is our best sacrifice, what resources we can give. We look at David, he said, I do not want to bring a sacrifice that costs me nothing. So there is something that costs you. Workmanship is the quality. We're talking about our expression, our quality. Do we do things with passion or are we very half-hearted? You know some people, you can see, their face is very half-hearted. Right? I mean, some people, they, they leave their expression right in the front. So it's the workmanship, our movement. Are, are we doing the best that we can? Personal touch. There is a unique touch. There is a unique anointing. There is a calling that only you can do and only you can apply. So that's why even in the house, there are certain things that people are just great. 
You know, you have, the, you have different people in different ministries because they are called, they are gifted. Even some of you, maybe you say, oh, I'm just, I'm just uh, filling up the role. I'm just a calafe or whatever. But you're still doing a job. And God can promote you and cause that to become a unique touch. Robustness. Would it stand the test of time? Now, suddenly I think about workmanship, the expression, you know. And, you know, just I remember David was trying to stir people up. And, and you know, if you want to have that passion to celebrate, you need to watch football. You need to watch sports. When you see them scoring and winning the kind of pure expression. And, and, and you know, especially football, football more than basketball. Football, or even the celebration, you know, like people like Ronaldo, Messi, they all have their unique celebration, you know. It's like only... They created it and there's a whole story behind it. The other day I was just reading, you know, Ronaldo has a, has a celebration, right? You are turn around, 180, and land. Actually, it's quite hard to do. You try to do it, you, you may slip, okay? <coughs> there is a story behind it. Why he's doing that? He wants to <coughs> express something out from the depth of his emotion. So it's very interesting that some of us need that losing up. Some of us need to yeah, do what you need to do, okay? So if you need recommendation, talk to some of our people. Now, interestingly, next week we are just releasing our sports podcast episode, but we're not talking so much about sports, more about politics. But still, just find something that stirs your passion. I mean, if you play chess and you have passion, that's fine. Go, go there. Then, then the joy of winning, that will cause that <laughs> expression to come up. Yeah, I mean, we all have something that when we do, we find like we are really, really expressing the very best of our emotion. Okay, moving on. So, we cross into the year 5782 proper and I really feel like the Lord wants to develop His house in the seven months. Now, this is not easy, it's challenging, but very quickly, let's just a quick reminder. Now, Seven Mountain has been around for 20, 30 years and and there was a lot of attack. Today, even if you, if you Google Seven Mountain, it's all negative article. But one of the things I learned about spiritual things is, is if there are tremendous amount of negativity, probably you're on the right track. Yeah, seriously. And in the early days of the apostolic prophecy, I used to get very disturbed for a while. But Seven Mountain is not a doctrine. It's not a theology. It's not a dominion uh, kind of teaching. But it's simply a template. It's simply a strategy for us to understand culture molders. You know molders, right? When, when you do cake, when you do cookie, you have molder, you know, the, the achuang. You put a thing, then you, you, you came out with certain product. So we're talking about there are certain aspects in our society that greatly shape our culture. You think about the media. I think the last few years, media has been so powerful in good ways and in bad ways. You think about entertainment, all the good things and all the bad things that happen. You think about education. Education is one of the biggest influencers of culture, I believe, even in Malaysia. So if you want to shift how, the way our children think, we have to shift the whole education. It's not easy. Some of you are called into that mountain. So culture molders. We are talking about different segments of society that have great influence over culture. Why is it important? Because... We think about making disciples of nation. You want to convince entire nation, entire people group that the kingdom way is better. So to do that, you have to establish culture. You have to shift and conquer the mountain. That's a very, very quick summary about Seven Mountain. We will go in more depth in our series, okay? So for us as part of the Ecclesia, we need to understand there is such a thing called gospel or kingdom. Jesus dies so that the gospel of kingdom can be expressed out. And it has power, authority. Jesus obtained himself to shift and transform the world. So this is the baseline. We, we must understand that the power of the cross actually can overcome. When Jesus ascended into heaven, that's right, he said, all power and authority, right? All have been given unto me. Therefore, I sent you out. So our goal, very simple, the kingdom of God be established so that a great harvest can be obtained and then restoration of all things. And then in Matthew, remember Jesus talked about when the gospel of kingdom is preached to all nations, then the end will come. So, so that's kind of exciting, right? Okay, can you imagine Jesus came back when you're still here 
uh, I don't know if that will happen. A lot, some people think it might. A lot of people think no. But that would be so great, right? It's like you are, you are translated immediately with a new body. Anyway, that's another topic. Okay, so let's look at Seven Mountain. This is a James Nesbitt picture. And, and we, we just broadly... Now, of course, the, the history of Seven Mountain is, is you have two ministers came together and, and they talk about it. Some people say, why seven? Why not eight? Why not nine? Okay, you can have your nine mountain. It's okay. No problem. You can have your three mountain. It's okay. So, it's just a strategy. It's just a template. Don't get too caught up in all this. But I, I find that it's broadly accurate. And some people say, oh, maybe we should have a mountain for technology. Maybe. Maybe. Um, so, you look at the, the, the left side is where the church usually we are involved. Religion. Then, most of the time, the body of Christ will, do, will deal with family, right? So we have Sunday school and things like that. Then maybe a bit of education. You have a Christian school. But after the first three, you can see that the body of Christ for the longest time we have avoided. Our government is bad. Media or media are all bunch of liars. Us and entertainment don't even think about going to the mountain. Business or oh, business is very bad. Just be a good employee. So yeah, I, I mean that's the teaching, right? If you came, if you come from any traditional kind of setting, this is what you hear. And the most ironic thing about Christians is when you have business owners that don't even encourage their own children to go into business. Seriously. So it shows that we have been totally deceived. But I'm not going to the teaching today. I only want all of us to consider this question. Look at all these things. What culture models, what, which mountain do you think the law have assigned you to be in? That's very important. And it can be a few. Now, it cannot be all seven, but it can be a few. It can be two or three or four. And you're going to ask God, because this is very, very important in this season. We are going into the place. Because this is where the wealth is. This is where the influence is. This is where the Cyruses are. You don't get Cyrus in church. Cyrus is an outsider. Cyrus may visit your church, but he's not your tribe. He's not aligned with you, but he will help you. So that's why we need to find the Cyruses in all the mountain, and then we will get the resources we need. Okay, so a few questions to, to, to cause you to think about, and we'll unpack them in the weeks to come. What are the core spiritual and natural gifts required to succeed? One of the things that we really find is that people don't think about the natural aspect. And, and so this is something that I, I want to encourage everyone to think. Let's say you are supposed to go into entertainment. Then you're like, okay, what is your gift? Can you sing? Can you dance? Then you better sing and dance well. You better know how to look great. This is common sense. It's like you can't go into entertainment mountain and look like Fill in your own blends, okay? And so, so that's a, the natural part that you need to develop. Or, or if you say you are going to media, then you have to be able to communicate. You have to speak well. You have to have good intonation. You have to fix your pronunciation, for example. Right? So, so the natural gift, and I declare in this season, God will upgrade our natural gift along with our spiritual gift. Now, being in the right mountain is very similar to being in the right place and right time. So that's why it's not a casual question. You can just say, oh, that looks nice, but are you called to go there? Are you assigned in that place? In that mountain, you have to ask another question. Who are the microchurches? Remember, microchurches is not a place. It's the people. I mean, we have a few microchurches who are still developing, but you have to ask yourself, if I'm in that area, who are the people that God caused me to align with that will co cause encouragement to come, spiritual warfare support to come, intercessory support to come? Very important. We can't walk this war alone. Then after that, this is the most challenging but most interesting. Who are the Cyrus influences that the Lord will give you? So it's like Joseph found Pharaoh. Daniel found Cyrus. Darius, so many Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, Daniel has so many influences in his whole life. Then you look at Paul. Paul found uh, Lydia. Paul found Luke. People, Paul found people who are rich, who are also part of the kingdom of God, but also from outside. Nehemiah, of course, had the Persian king, etc., etc., etc. Then the next part, which is going to be uh, something that, again, is challenging, but we have to think about it. What is the measurable objective and standard of success? That means if you are called to a mountain, 
what would it be to consider your assignment a success? So let's say you have a prophet here and say, oh, you'll bring tremendous wealth. So what is the meaning of tremendous wealth? Tremendous wealth maybe means you're going to have a public listed company, for example. You're going to have millions. You're able to give millions to the kingdom of God because you, that's just for your tithes. So, so based on what you hear, based on where you are, this is constantly evolving. Now, I know some of you are like, oh, come on, I can't even think about that. I, I'm like barely surviving. But it's okay. The prophetic words, the, the belief, the calling, the processing, at some point, you're going to have to write it down. What are you called to do? So some of us, some of you, and even at Sibu, remember we commissioned out wealth creator. And wealth creator, of course, everyone wants to be a wealth creator. But are you called? What are your fruits? And I, I know many are having that fruits, having that potential. And very, very soon, I believe the Lord will say, it's time to be sent. And then you will need to begin to say, what will I do? What is my objective? So these are seven mountain teaching which we'll deal with. Okay, let's come to the next one. Dealing with covenant roots. So what is the definition of covenant roots? I just give a very simple definition. Basically, it means a foundation. But it's not your foundation. It's something established by your bloodline. Something established by your ancestors, by those who came before you. Obviously related to you, okay? Other people, ancestors are not your bloodline. Okay, don't confuse that, okay? So the covenant roots can be for better or for the worse. So covenant roots, it is linked. Now, how do we have covenant, covenant roots? It is linked with the way your bloodline had worship and sacrifice. That's why some negative and, and evil bloodline came because our ancestors worship evil spirit. They worship an evil altar. But if they worship the true God, then you have the good roots. So that's why every bloodline, you have the good and the bad. The moment we are conceived, we get all the good and all the bad. Then it's up to us, how do we separate the root? It's up to us, how do we get rid of the bad things? How do we develop the good things? Now, many blessings and curses, you see, they, they all come together, one, of covenant roots. What is the origin? The origin usually comes from extravagant giving or lack of giving. So many curses came from no giving. So that's why, if there is a lack of giving in the bloodline, it becomes so important for your generation to establish the pattern of giving. You break the curse. You break the root. So that's why the Passover season, which is now, is always a time for us to get connected, to get acquainted. And sometimes you have to talk to your parents, you have to talk to your grandparents. And I know it's like we, we did FIC and we just put on the things, but it's more than just put on. It's finding the good, finding the bad. So if we found that there is a blessed covenant root. It's a good thing. What do you want to do? You want to redig, like what Isaac did, right? Isaac dig it again. Like what David did. He, re he remembered, he knew he was from the house of Judah. So he dig. So, so then you want to establish it in present time. And this one really caused me to think about the prophetic words, especially for Sibu, because when you study the history of Sibu, so many of us are linked there. And this is what the Lord reminded me that after the second generation, the people have abandoned God. This is a fact. And God wants us to reconnect with the origin, original covenant root, which He gave them when He landed, when the people, when the believer landed. So it's very important. We need to look for the blessed covenant roots. Then there is a cursed covenant root. All the bad things. Not very complicated. Just had to get rid of it. Found it and get rid of it. And make sure that it doesn't continue from your line. Now, I'll give you an example. You, you know, the giants will destroy in flood, right? Genesis 6, you have the Nephilim. The giants will, will, will kill. And then how many people survive the flood? Eight people, right? How come, how come the giants came back? Because one of the daughter-in-law, probably the mother of Canaan, because Canaan looked like a giant, you look at Noah's reaction and he cursed Canaan for someone else's sin. That's why Canaan, the land, full of giants. That's why it is not so easy, even if you have eight people left, the bad seeds still come out. Think about the permutation of your line. I mean, just go out three generations, wow, so many possibilities, so many possibilities of bad things. But every time we discover it, we get rid of it. 
It's that simple. So covenant rules, a few more points. What it does is it combines, see we have an individual gift, we have an individual potential. Unfortunately, in the body of Christ, we, we kept on focusing individual. And, and this is very much reflected in, in the way we, we do evangelism, right? Oh, it's your personal choice. But you see, once you are in, in that, uh, once you receive faith, your, your bloodline affects you, no matter how. So when we understand the covenant roots, it, it kind of merges us into the bloodline for better or for worse. That's why we develop the good things, we get rid of the bad things. Covenant roots, by reclaiming what our forefathers had missed, because even though the promises were there, some generation will miss it. First generation Israel leaving Egypt, they missed that, right? 40 years. Then the second generation, that's why Joshua generation redeemed 40 years of wilderness. This is what it can do. So some of you, you may have the previous generation that missed certain great opportunity. Maybe it is time for you to redeem it. Maybe it's time for you to say, it is mine. Actually, I always hear all these stories, you know, people have land and then because of the war, the Japanese came, they, you know, all kinds of stories. I mean, it's like they used to be rich and then they lost. I tell you, wealth transfer can change just like that in one generation. So why not just like that you get it? Especially if it's part of your bloodline. So when we discover the bloodline, this is what will happen. The next generation either become more faithful or they become less faithful and wander away. It's always like that. We can only fight for our generation. We want, that's why the last point is how do we have that generational impartation? But even when you do that impartation, it's still up to them. You can teach the, your children to the very best that you can, but when they're adults, it's up to them. You can't control them anymore, right? So I already mentioned Cebu second generation shifted away from God, but I believe God is going to restore it and even cause the next, the fourth and fifth generation to redeem it. So the pay they get, remember, is an intense warfare over the manifestation of covenant roots. So by the way, some of you will be like, oh, you know, like, like when I was born, even my grandparents were no more, already, already dead on my father's side. So some of us will be like, oh, we don't even have data. You know, now that we talk about data, right? We don't have information. So sometimes this revelation will come from prophetic revelation, from word of knowledge. And then all the pieces will come. You will have enough to make a determination. Okay, the next point. Possessing cities we did not build. Um, so let, let's start off with um, the, the verse, okay? Deuteronomy 6, 10, and this was... Moses reminded them again, this was what God promised you. Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that's why you see the covenant root concept. It's always linked back to the covenant. To give you great and splendid, not just any city, great and splendid cities which you did not build. So Joshua did a 40 years conquest. Can you imagine fighting war for 40 years? It's like, wow, so tiring, right? And he captured many, many, many cities, which became available for distribution among the tribe. By the way, do you know when you read the book of Joshua, the word cities were mentioned more than 80 times? Because at the end, he had to do so much distribution. Can you imagine he has so much money? It's like, okay, all of you have, have a thing. Can you imagine we have so much money that even if you have 0.01%, it's still million? That is essentially what happened with Israel. Some of the tribe didn't do much and they get less city, but it's still cities. We don't even have one city. And some tribe get a few cities by doing basically, okay, not nothing, but they're like the least performing tribe. Yeah, they still have moral support, cheerleader. Hey, you think cheerleader is not important? It's very important, man. <laughs> Professional sports employ cheerleader all the time. Actually, cheerleader is not for the play, it's more for the crowd. <laughs> but anyway, that's a... So, 80 times, 80 times. So, so interesting. And cities become part of the great inheritance. And by the way, you know that some of the tribe just kind of becoming lazy and they got absorbed. But still, that 40 years of inheritance sustained them for a few hundred years. That's why sometimes you say, there's an inheritance, right? And, and we, you know, the way we talk about, yes, you can lose wealth in, in, in one generation, but some certain kind of wealth no matter how you waste it, it will take a few generations to waste it. So for example, you know, you talk about the, the top uh, richest people in the world, if you inherited all their things, no matter how irresponsible you are, it will still take a few generations to waste it. So this is the thing for, for Joshua's generation, 40 years and it allowed them to continue. 
And Joshua kind of just confirmed it and said, this is what the Lord said. I gave you, so this was at the time of fulfillment already at the end of his assignment. I gave you a land of which you had not labor, that means you didn't work for it, and cities which you had not built, basically confirming what the Lord promised them in Deuteronomy 6. So here's a great example. Remember we talk about revelation, you receive revelation, but how do you process it? How do you step into reality? So you, you see Joshua kind of demonstrated they already obtained the city because Joshua 24 was at the end of the distribution. Everyone received their cities. So the Lord in Deuteronomy 6 prophesied through Israel's covenant roots. That's why it's so important. You want to get the cities you do not build, you need to look at your covenant roots. What? You know, Israel had a covenant roots in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What about your family? What about your line? What about your bloodline? You have to ask God, what is my inheritance? Because do I get cities? Where is the city? Do I get nations? Where are the nations? You have to ask this kind of question. So such was the favor. Everyone says favor. favor. So the Lord reserved for them, even though it took them 80 years. Remember, 40 years in wilderness. 40 years of warfare to get cities. 80 years. One generation did not, did not even see the inheritance. So here's the thing about favor. It's from God. It, it is really from God. But it requires obedience. It requires some action. So for Israel, 40 years of wilderness, then it requires another 40 years of what? Warring, pressing, possessing. So that's why, do we want the same favor? Of course, we all say yes, but we have to understand the nature of favor. Pressing, pressing, pressing. It's like a door that you need to walk through. We have to do certain things. Otherwise, the favor will not be crystallized. You know, that, that's a legal term. When, when, you have a, when you have a voucher, when you have a, you know, something that can be redeemable, you need to crystallize it. You need to go to bank. You need to write an instruction. And the bank says, okay, I'll credit it into your bank account. That's why is that million ringgit. Last one. And it's linked with the last point. Generational impartation. So you think about Joshua, successful campaign. And he was like, oh, I'm, I'm, how old he was? 120. 120, right? Correct? Yeah. Finally, time to retire, graduate. You know what's the meaning of graduate? Graduate to heaven, right? So he had victories, right? He was stepping into the promises of God. Great achievement. He said, oh, he could just go and kaki and say, oh, look at what I have done. I've given you all the cities you should be thankful to be. You should make me the emperor of this land. No, he didn't say that. But he was more concerned about the impact on the generation because he understood what David and Apostle Paul will later be recognized. Remember, these things are described to them. They have fulfilled their purposes within their generation. So Joshua understood that even at that point. Moses understood that. Now, Moses, by the way, do you know that? Do you realize Moses also fulfilled his, his destiny? He did what was needed. He brought them out. He couldn't bring them in, but he did. He, 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 he ushered the deliverance. But Joshua, after distributing all the cities, Joshua 24, 15, and he said to them, you have all the inheritance here, but let me just tell you right now, you have choices. Choose for yourself today whom you will serve, whether the gods of which your father served in Egypt or the gods of Amorites now in Canaan, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So he was giving them three alternatives. And we can see what it means here in terms of the generational impartation. See, with the Moses generation, they faced the gods of Egypt before they crossed Jordan, right? So, so once you cross Jordan, it's Canaanite. It's Canaan. But before that, it was still wilderness. It was still Egypt. So those are the gods that kept Israel in wilderness because they couldn't take out the god of Egypt. They couldn't overcome the deliverance. And that's why 40 years was needed. So he was just reminding them, do you want to go back to this era? Because remember, they wanted to go back to Egypt. Right? All of a sudden, they said, oh, we miss the food. We miss the garlic. We miss the leek. It's like, oh my. Some people can really be seduced by food. And that's what happened with um, Esau, right? Esau, for a moment of flesh, Witness gave out his inheritance. That's why God said, I hated Esau. For someone to give away your inheritance over the comfort of your flesh, God said, I hated you. Then he said, or oh, what we are doing right now, 
Do you want to do what we're doing right now? We're in Canaan, we're in Canaan, we're fighting the Amorites, we overcame them, we have our inheritance, but this is not our future. Do you realize that Joshua was telling them, we have done great, but this is not our future. But there is a future. What will you choose? Every decision will cause a pattern of prosperity or a pattern of curse. And we see that immediately in the book of Judges, right? 400 years of cycle. And really, like what the Hawking said, right? Usi ki, usi law. That's really the book of Judges. But we, we don't want that. That's not a very stable kind of life, right? I mean, I, I was just thinking about the era you want to live. Right? Definitely not in Judges. It's like you can die anytime. Right? So, so that's why Israel did not choose wisely. And I, I believe that is why after, after um, Joshua, God did not appoint another leader because he wanted them to be self starter He wanted the tribes to be self starter and, and they couldn't and they were overcame. That's why from time to time, God had to raise out a judge. After 40 years, after 50 years, after 80 years, whatever years of, of bondages, a judge will be appointed and, and, and they will cause Israel to gain freedom. Okay, last round already. So processing your Passover, we are finishing Passover. Now we had a tremendous regional Passover celebration. I mean, it was really, really great. And, and that's why I think later on we'll put in the announcement the next date. If you, I mean, I always say this, you, you know me, I, I don't force people to go to Feast One. <laughs> that's, that's not my style. But I want to encourage you that if you feel like you needed to be there and, and you're able to, financially able, practically able to, then, then you want to join us at Pentecost. Uh, for a lot of people, Pentecost, it's really the great time. You know, it's the blessings. It's the fire of God. I mean, I personally prefer Passover, but it's going to be very, very interesting. So if you're able to come, just plan now. And what we're doing today, we're just continuing the celebration because basically, why we do this, we, we want everyone to have an opportunity to cross over. Everyone to be able to cross over. Uh, just yesterday, I saw Chuck Pierce put in his Facebook, he said, it's time to review your Passover crossing. And he was putting a video People dancing, right? So it's like, it's like sometimes you think, oh, why is worship, why is dancing? It is to cause you to cross over. Why do you dance? Because some of us need to dance out from our misery and from our past and be ready for your future. You see, the Lord wants us to look at our crossing over steps. What are we doing? Are we doing the right thing to be able to cross over? And He wants us to have a great future. Now, by the way, these two lines are not the same thing. You see, God wants you to prosper, but it doesn't mean that you are prospering. Right? Remember the verse, God's desire is that none shall perish, right? But many people are still perishing. So His desire and the reality are not the same. So crossing over, pass over, really, is to reconcile. There is the will of God. There is the desire of God. And we're just hearing Robert Heiler teach the other day, which is a... a just an astounding truth. And he say that God's first choice for Jacob was Leah. Actually, I think about it, I think it makes perfect sense because it's Jacob's personal emotion wanting Rachel so much. The moment he saw her, a soul tie was developed. I mean, you are like, people are like, oh, how can soul tie be developed? So he said, I tell you, it can. <laughs> yes, you see, a, a look and and he was willing to labor for years and years and years and cause him to miss out. What proof do you need? Judah came from Leah. What proof do you need? Now, Joseph was great. Benjamin was great. But we are talking about first choice and when we created a second choice, just like Abraham was supposed to, 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 have, the, to have Isaac, but all of a sudden, he, he and Sarah got impatient and they, they produced Ishmael. So this is the moment that we are in right now. That there is God's desire, there is the will, but are we going to reconcile into our reality? I think this is the whole issue of Passover. And once we understand this, then we just need the faith. The faith, our determinations and our actions. So as we finish off, it's a very simple question. We are finishing Passover already. Very soon, we're coming to the next month, right? We're coming to the, uh, to the next celebration already. Yeah. 
are we prepared to cross over into our future? So Lord, right now I just pray that as we finish off the season of Passover, Lord, you'll cause us to deal with the reproach and all the emotional issues of past and present that will allow us to move into the future. And I declare right now that we will take the faith and necessary steps to fully cross over into the future that we're supposed to be. All right, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. So we're done for today.